watch this very, very carefully, and I will just talk you through it. An elk, wild, suddenly appeared on a highway, not to challenge into the automobile, but the elk was trying to do something that nobody could figure out. One woman thought maybe this wild elk needed to be petted, and that's what she did. But the elk stayed there, stayed there and bugled. And the cars grow off, and one man saw he needed help, so he followed him down the trail to see what he wanted, and he discovered there were elks who were caught in mud in a bog. One of them had already been died, three of them were there, and that elk had gone up there risking his life and got people to come and pull those elk out. They put water on them. One at a time, they brought them out until finally all three were saved, miraculously so. And then the elk, after they were saved and cleaned up, they stayed around the humans, looking in their face, and they thought they were looking at them to remember who they were. And then they gave that bugle, thanking the people who had rescued his three companions. I've never seen or heard of anything like that in the wild. Evidently, an elk got caught in the quicksand of the bog and couldn't get out, and another two or three went in, and one of them couldn't make it, and the other three would never have made it. But that one elk did an amazing thing. You can be sure that elk had been taught his whole life and had learned, stay away from humans. The number one enemy of elks is humans. But seeing his three family part of the herd, knowing they would die and never get out, he did an amazing thing, that elk. Went up to the highway, did you get it? Confronted automobiles finally convinced some man who followed him down and saw that these other three were about to succumb, they could never get out of the bog. And he went and got some humans who threw ropes over their heads, you saw it, and pulled them out one after another after another. And these elk from the wild stayed around after they were cleaned up and washed looked at the humans who had saved them, and then you heard that bugle at the end, I guess saying, thank you. I've never heard, received, or imagined a story like that. It's a story of rescue, of rescue, is it not? Dramatic rescue in the wild. Now, a lot of people think that Christianity is a religion. Christianity in no way, shape, form, or fashion is a religion theologically or actually or technically or linguistically. Christianity is not a religion because religions describe what we do as humans to be right with God. That's religion. What you don't do, what I don't do, what you do, and what I don't, all the rules and regulations are man-made in all the other religions of the world except Christianity. Christianity is revelation and rescue. Revelation. Jesus came and the form of God became the form of man and was God-man, giving revelation. This is what God is like. 
This is how God operates. This is what God would have you to do. That is Jesus revealing God to all who will take a long look at him. Christianity is revelation and it is rescue. Jesus came to reveal God to us and he came to rescue you and me from the trash of your life and the trash of my life as we are basically self-centered individuals. God in Christ came all the way from heaven to rescue us. The rescue was provided on the cross and the truth of the rescue was affirmed on the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ, which absolutely validated that he was indeed a revelation of God and he did indeed come to rescue you and to rescue me. That's the difference. That's the whole biblical story. Revelation and rescue. Now, we're gonna look at the very familiar parable of the Good Samaritan. And we're going to look at it in a way that I had never really looked at it before. As you know, if you remember the story, it is a story of rescue, but it's far, far more than that. A parable, we said, is a human story with heavenly ramifications. We discovered that the parables of Jesus, he took truth and threw it down. The word parabole means to throw down beside something. He said, you know what this is like. And therefore he threw down a kingdom principle and said, therefore you know what this is like. And sometimes he would use not the same thing, like something, a simile, but he would go in, in contrast. You know what this is like, and this is the very opposite of that. And he's given us kingdom principles. You get that? Kingdom principles that are valid now and that will be valid throughout all eternity. So we come to the parable of the Good Samaritan and let's just look at it. I hope you have your Bible with you. It's found in Luke chapter number 10. If you don't have a Bible with you, look in the pew rack in front. Matthew, Mark, Luke. You got to have a program to keep up with what's going on, to remember what's going on, or you sit there and it goes whoop, whoop. So have a Bible with you. Didn't bring one. Look on somebody next to you. Look in the pew in front. Turn to Luke, Matthew, Mark, Luke, 10th chapter. And Jesus there is speaking to a group of people. Now, when Jesus would speak, he would sit down. That's what all teachers did in that day. They would sit down, everybody else would sit down, but if someone wanted to speak up, they would stand up. And so here we see a setting, Jesus is teaching a group of people, a large group of people, all kinds of people there, all walks of life there, and suddenly look what happens. Luke 10, 25, on one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. The word test is the same word was used in the wilderness of temptations when Jesus was tempted, remember? An expert in the law stood up. This was a lawyer. Now, there are three professions that have more jokes told about them than any other professions. Preachers, doctors, and lawyers especially lawyers. And you in that profession can figure that out for yourself. <laughs> in fact, I love the story of a family that was going through a cemetery and they were looking at all the tombstones and the father said, hey, come over here. This is something you've never seen before. Look at this tombstone. It said, here lies a lawyer and an honest man. <laughs> and the feather said, come quickly, there are two people buried here in this grave. <laughs> but here we have a lawyer who stands up 
And he'd been charging $2,000 an hour for a lot of years because he was a big time lawyer. In our world, he'd call himself an attorney. Same thing, but anyway, that's what, he was a religious lawyer. He had advocated for the state. He'd advocated in the Sanhedrin. He had done relationships with the Romans who dominated Israel. He'd even dealt with all the sects that were involved. There were 24 different groups of Judaism that came in this particular period of time. We'd call them denominations or abominations, whatever word you want to use. And therefore, he had been in high class, delicate, legal situations that involved the laws of Rome, the laws of Israel, the laws of God. It was all connected in that theocracy, which was the order of the day. So this lawyer stood up in the middle of Jesus' teaching, and he asked this question to test Jesus. He said, teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Big question, isn't it? He's saying, what must I do to be rescued from this life, which I know I will die, and what must I do to have eternal life, life after this life? Big question. We all ask ourselves this question at different times, different places. And you can get a myriad of answers in the culture in which we live. But here he asked Jesus, teacher, by the way, that indicated he was knew something about what Jesus was doing. Teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why was he trying to trap test Jesus? Because Jesus had thrown out all barriers. Jesus was associated, he was related to the worst kind of people in all of Israel. Oh yeah. I mean, those who didn't go to temple, those who were profane, those who, who worked with their hands and had calluses, the, the, the common people of all backgrounds, Jesus was associated with them, and I can guarantee you the Pharisees didn't like it. The Sadducees were frightened, and I guarantee this teacher was seeing that Jesus was doing something that they never experienced before because he taught not, not like, well, what do you think about this? He spoke with authority as if he were God himself. Whew. Teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus looked at this lawyer and said, what is written in the law? And Jesus asked, well, how do you interpret that? And we know the lawyer that was an easy layup question. Because do you realize the Jew, every morning, the first thing they would do would quote and listen to the Shema, Deuteronomy 6? Every morning, Deuteronomy 6. Every afternoon, Deuteronomy 6, they'd go over it again. Every night before they went to bed, every Jew from the time they could understand Deuteronomy 6, the Shema, over and over and over and over and over again, was pounded in the heart. They'd have the Shema written over the doorpost. They'd have the Shema in different places in the house. So anything everybody knew, every believing, practicing Jew knew, even a modified practicing Jew, they knew what was in the Shema. On top of that, you can be pretty sure that that very religious lawyer had phylactery on his wrist, maybe on his head, in that phylactery, it would be verses from the Shema, Deuteronomy 6. And there would be verses from Leviticus 19, particularly verse 18. Put those two verses together, what do you have? You have exactly the answer that the lawyer gave to Jesus. The lawyer asked the question, Jesus said, well, how do you interpret this? He flipped it back on him. And he said, how do you understand that? And the lawyer said, remind you, there's a whole bunch of people there, perhaps a thousand or so. The lawyer said, you shall love the Lord thy God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. First commandment. Then he said, 
Love your neighbor as you love yourself. And Jesus said, A plus. You got it right. That's exactly on target. Here we see Jesus and this lawyer agreeing. And then Jesus said, go and put it into practice. Okay. Love God with every ounce of everything and love your neighbor as you love yourself. And then you see what happened. All this had flipped on the law. Remember I said a parable is a, a mirror and a window. Here, all of a sudden, the lawyer was asking the question. And by the way, an, an esteemed lawyer will never ask the question in a court of law unless they know the answer the witness is going to give. Every lawyer here will tell you that. Every lawyer here, if they've been in a courtroom, you've probably made that mistake. And you got to answer, whoa, I didn't want that. So they always know the answer. And the lawyer knew Phi Beta Kappa, this answer. It was a layup. He'd had it all of his life in the Shema. He had it all, and probably had it written in phylacteries on his wrist. Jesus said, you answered exactly. Now go put it into practice. Now here is the trick here that twists us. Nobody, nobody anywhere, any place, any time in history would be able to put that law into practice. Do you get that? You can't do it. The lawyer knew it, and certainly Jesus knew it. Love God with everything? Well, how do you know I love God? I try you. Love your neighbors, you love yourself. Oh, my. And then we see the lawyer gets in deeper trouble at all, and he understands it. And verse 29 is so good. He says, but he, the lawyer, wanted to justify himself. Let's stop right there and let this come home to you and to me. Do you ever try to justify? All the time. Do you try? Yes. Anybody? Oh, yes, every one of us. Well, I didn't go there because I had this. The real reason was this, though you think it's this. I look bad over here. I told that lie because I was trying to protect. I mean, we are... Experts, every one of us here at self-justification. Anybody who thinks you're not, would you stand up? I want to see you because you'll immediately be going to heaven. <laughs> so here the lawyer is trying to justify himself. Why is he trying to explain this? He was embarrassed. He asked a question. He knew the answer to it from the time he was three years old. And then Jesus flipped it on him, and he, he gave the answer. And then Jesus said, hey, you are a legalist. You are a religious legalist, a Pharisee, a God-fearing man. You go and put this in practice. Remember the question? What must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said, you go and practice this, and you've got life. You've got eternal life. That's what you do. That's the answer. And the lawyer was... I can't do that. I'm not doing that. I'm not even trying very hard. I've given up a long time ago. So he thought to justify himself by redirecting the conversation. Anybody do that? Ever seen that happen? And then he turned to Jesus and look what he said. But he wanted to justify himself. So he asked Jesus, well, who is my neighbor? In a debate, when you get caught, ask the person to define some terms. You familiar with that? Well, what do you mean by this? See, the lawyer was caught. He was captured. He was nailed down. It was discovered about his life. He wasn't as good and smart as ever died. So he tried to justify himself, and he did it by asking another question. Well, by the way, who is my neighbor? And in that day and time, and even to an extent today with serious ethical conversations take place, people want to know, who is your neighbor? Who is your neighbor? And this lawyer had been in all kinds of debate defining neighbor. Yeah, and it's still a debate, by the way. It'll be a debate when we leave here until I answer at the end. 
Is your neighbor uh, your family? You to love him the way you love yourself, your family? Oh, yeah, I'll work on that. Is your neighbor those that you know, or the neighbors are those who believe like you believe? Uh, is your neighbor the person who has the same education, the same color of skin, the same background, the same ethnicity, the same taste that you have? I, I, is that who your neighbor is? Uh, is your neighbor someone you haven't met? Who is your neighbor? And this is a question that is relevant. I could stand anybody up here as I have stood up myself as I've studied this and said, just exactly who do you think your neighbor is? And Jesus answered it with a parable, a true story, unbelievable story in that culture. Listen at it. Verse 30, in reply, Jesus said, a man go down from Jerusalem to Jericho. When he was attacked by robbers, they stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too the Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was. When he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him, bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii and gave the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra experience you may have had. Hello! The question before the house for all of us, as for that lawyer, who in the world is your neighbor? And the lawyer, the debate that day was, how big a circle do you take in for your neighbor? Where, where, where do you draw lines as to who your neighbor is? Where, where is the line that is drawn here? And Jesus tells this story, and what a story it was. Listen, the road from Jerusalem to Jericho is 17 miles. It's not in California, folks, I'm sorry. It's in 17 miles, and it goes all the way from Jerusalem all the way down to Jericho. It's about a 3,200-foot drop in 17 miles. Do you see it? I've been down the road myself. It is a winding road. It was called the road of blood because criminals, robbers would hide behind turns in the road and they would go and jump out and knock somebody in the head, take what they have and run, kind of like Houston, Texas today. <laughs> I can take you down a lot of roads. You'll have that experience, by the way. And so the robbers were up there, they were waiting. And here comes this Jewish man, foolishly going downhill. Perhaps he had goods with him and robbers come out and they, they take him. Evidently he resisted because he was beat up. They would probably just taken his stuff, but he wanted to fight. That's the reason he thought he was secure. And man, he was beaten to a pup. Have you ever seen anybody really, really, really beaten up? Oh, I've seen a black eye. And I, oh, no, no. Somebody beat to the ends of their life. If you've never seen that, you can't understand this. Teeth knocked out, eye closed, cut, bleeding, head, arms broken, bones. And it says, these robbers took everything he had and left him half dead in the pit, in the ditch by the road. Not an unfamiliar thing in our culture today. And if we don't wake up in America it's going to continue to be an unfamiliar thing. That those who denigrate and belittle law enforcement, those who do not have people who prosecute people, judges who are not honest according to the law, we're going to have that on and on. You think California is different? It'll be right here if we don't make radical changes in our culture. Beat up. And then coming down the road, going down to Jericho. By the way, Jericho was like going to Florida in that day. You didn't know that. 
In Jericho, the Hesmonians who'd rule, they had a palace there. Herod had four palaces in Jericho with a swimming pool, a sunken garden. You see, it got cold and windy up in Jerusalem and they went down to Jericho to Florida and that was sort of resort area. So evidently, this priest was going for a resort. He'd been working in the temple, sacrificing, praying, killing animals, putting his hands on people. He was worn out and he was going down for a little R&R, relief and relaxation. And he was going down to Jericho and he saw as he was going down the road, this guy who was, looked like he was dead. But you know, if he as a priest, as a holy man, would have gone and touched that man and he died, he would be ceremonially unclean. He couldn't do his job for several weeks. Whoa, man, I'm a holy man. So he saw this man beaten up and he, he went by on the other side. Coming along behind him, now a priest was the highest tribe of Aaron, Levite, man, highest, beautiful robes. I mean, when you saw him coming, you didn't say, I wonder who that is. <laughs> you, you could tell. Coming behind him was a Levite who was, led the music in the temple or had the business of the temple. He was coming right behind the priest and and he went over a little closer and saw the man was beaten up, but he said, you know, he may be dead, he may not be dead. And he just followed his, the priest who went on ahead of him. Now, think about the person in the pit, beaten up. I'm sure he saw the priest coming. He said, boy, am I lucky. Here comes a man of God who has been taught all of his life to minister to people but he went by him. Well, I'm lucky the Levite, I guess he asked him to take care of the brother. He went by on the other side too, if the man happened to be conscious. And then here comes Jesus telling the story. And I'm sure the audience saw, he's gonna say, well, here comes an ordinary Jew comes down. Oh no, he shocked them. Here comes this Samaritan. In Luke 10, where this story is told, look in, in, Luke, look in the chapter before, and you'll see that a Samaritan had mistreated, not given hospitality to James and John, two of Jesus' apostles. And James and John said, let me call down lightning on that Samaritan. Samaritan was the bottom of the bottom of the bottom of the bottom. Hey, remember the Samaritans were? You may not. In 722, Syria came and took over Israel and took a whole 22,000 people out of the Northern Kingdom. Some Jews were left and then Syria came in and they inhabited that kingdom and they intermarried. Jew married with a non-Jew, with a pagan. And that's who the Samaritans were. In fact, the Jews thought they not only heretics, they were not pleasing to God, and the Samaritans built their own place of worship on Mount Gerizim. They didn't believe that. Mount Gerizim, that's where we worship. And so they hated one another. They despised one another. They had nothing to do with one another. And of all things, Jesus is telling this story and said, well, here's the priest and here, here is the Levite went by on the other side. And now a Samaritan stops, goes down into the pit, who, oh, and ministers to the man, took wine, washed all of his wounds. Uh, he went on and took some oil and tried to comfort him. Well, that ought to be enough. Don't you know how, how far you have to go? This guy hates me. And then he picked him up. Oh and he put him on his donkey. Well, that's enough. And he walked all the way with the man on his donkey all the way to an inn, checked the man in, paid for two denarii. That would be 24 days of food 
and said, look after him. He said, I'm going to come back. This is a Samaritan now. And if it's any overcharges, anything I missed to take care of him, I will pay you when I return. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, we go by on the other side all the time, every one of us, because we've discovered when you go down in the pit and you try to help and love and restore, it's dangerous. Maybe it's a setup. Maybe, the, the, maybe somebody's not really hurt and they're waiting to rob me. It's dangerous. It is forbidden. You don't have to do it. And man, it sure is costly of time, energy, and money if you really get down like the Samaritan did in order to rescue someone. We all understand that. And the bottom line is the Jericho Road goes right down in the middle of every step I take and every step you take every day of the life. And we're more like the priest and the Levites, most of us, than we are the Good Samaritan. Anybody want to debate that? And then we come to the end of the story. Powerful, powerful ending of the story. Jesus said, which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell the hand of robbers? Let me tell you what happens with our rationalization when how we discover and deal with people who are in the pit. And by the way, how big is the circle? How, where is the line of love as to who our neighbors is? That line of love is the same line of love that God has and God doesn't leave out anybody, anytime, anywhere. Once a man fell into a pit, he couldn't get himself out. Man beat up in the pit. A sensitive person came along and said, I feel for you down there. And look in the mirror, folks. A practical person came along and said, I knew you were going to call in that pit sooner or later. A Pharisee came. Only bad people fall into a pit. A mathematician calculated how far he fell. <laughs> a news reporter won an exclusive story on his pit. An IRS agent asked if he were paying taxes on the pit. A politician dropped an absentee ballot and a free cell phone down into the pit. <laughs> so true. A, a self-pitying person, a self-pitying person said, you haven't seen anything until you've seen my pit. <laughs> a mystic said, just imagine you're not in a pit. We've got churches that teach that in the entire town. The optimist said, things could be worse. A pessimist said, things will get worse. But what did the Good Samaritan do? The same thing Jesus would do. He would get down in that pit, minister to the person, pick the person up, and take them out of the pit. Right? And then the real twist hits our lawyer friend. Which one of these were a neighbor and the expert in the law replied, hmm. the Samaritan who had mercy on him and Jesus said, go and do likewise. He already said if the question began, what does it take for me to have eternal life? And Jesus said, keep this law, number one, number two, perfectly, number one, love God with all you have. That's the vertical relationship. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. That's the horizontal relationship. And the law you knew, he couldn't do it, and we know no human being can do it. And then you decide who is my neighbor, 
and my neighbor is anybody, anywhere, anytime that we're able to go and love and minister and seek to help and heal and to rescue them from life, in life. Whew. It says he had compassion on him. What is compassion? It's my pain in your heart. Did you get the definition? Compassion is your pain in my heart or my pain in your heart. That is compassion, but compassion is enough. Mercy is we have compassion and we respond to that compassion by getting down in the pit and trying to rescue that person, lead them to Christ, minister to their life, let them know that God loves them and let them know by our actions that we love them too. Ladies and gentlemen, if we who name the name of Jesus would do just a microscopic example of what Jesus is telling us to practice, it would change everything, everything, everything. I preach a lot of sermons, have a long time. And sometimes I see happening here what happened to Demosthenes, the great orator, Greek orator. Demosthenes spoke, the world listened. His diction, his vocabulary, his eloquence. But once he was speaking to a large crowd and he saw people dozing off to sleep. And I said, you know, I have that same experience. <laughs> And sometimes they're on the front row. <laughs> and sometimes they sing in the choir. And sometimes they're way away where nobody can see. Listen, I've had my eyes fixed. Be careful. <laughs> Demosthenes saw this. They were not interested. He was talking about profound things of life. Birth, life, death calling, purpose, priority, but they were going to sleep. So we stopped and he told this story. He said once there was a man who wanted to carry a load of wood over a mountain and he saw another man who owned a donkey and he went over and rented that donkey from the man. He said, I want to take the donkey, put my wood in his back, go over that mountain and I want to rent him for a day. And the man, they agreed on a fee and the donkey was rented. The man put his wood all on his back and he's leading the donkey up that mountain. It was a steep mountain. It was hot. And he got halfway up and he was exhausted and the donkey was exhausted and he decided he'd stop in the shade and take a nap. He looked around, there was no shade, only rock. And so he looked, the only shade there was the shade of the donkey. And he said, well, I'm going to take a nap. So he w went on and he was lying down. By the way, lying, not laying. Lying is when something is alive. Laying is when something is inanimate, but that's too fast. <laughs> so he went on. He was lying down in the shadow of the donkey and went to sleep. The man who owned the donkey was walking the same mountain. He got hot and tired. He wanted to rest. He looked for some shade. There was no shade around, just rock. And he saw the man asleep in the shadow of the donkey that he had rented him. So the man went over there and said, would you get up out of the shadow of the donkey? I want a nap there. And the man said, wait a minute, I rented the donkey and the shadow goes with the donkey. He said, you only rented the donkey. He didn't say anything about the shadow. <laughs> so they were getting into a vicious argument. At that moment, Demosthenes walked off the stage. He went out of sight. The people went crazy. Demosthenes, come back. Who owned the shadow? Who had the right to the shadow? And they shouted and shouted for a long time. They were so frustrated. They wanted to know the end. And then dramatically, Demosthenes walked back and they got real quiet. And he said, just as I thought, you're more interested in who owned the shadow of a jackass than you are great principles of life. <laughs> a 
Ladies and gentlemen, this is a great principle of the Christian life we're dealing with today. Who's your neighbor? Who's my neighbor? Everybody. Everybody. Regardless of everybody. I thought of an old poem. He drew a circle that shut me out. Heretic, rebel, a thing to flout. But love and I had the wit to win. We drew a circle that took him in. That, ladies and gentlemen, is how we as members of God's family must begin to live.